everyone, and welcome to the Only Land Fan Show. My name is Kendall Lejeune, and our guest today is Ray John. About 11 years back, Ray John came to the United States. Right after that, he ended up homeless and had to gather free stuff to sell for survival. He then got into selling cars, which paid the bills, but didn't really float his boat, so he switched gears to real estate. Everything changed around five years ago when he shifted his focus to dealing with land. That's when the wind started rolling in. Just last year, he and his team raked in a net profit of around $900,000. The coolest part is he's never even seen the land he's working with. It's all virtual, and that for him is the ultimate taste of freedom. Ray, thanks so much for joining us. Let's just jump right in. How did you get started in doing land deals? So I was flipping cars, and uh, I had some extra time in the morning and afternoon because I was in Hawaii, right? So I was thinking, is there anything else I can do? So I started to learn about land flipping, and that's when everything started to happen. Very cool. And so you were on this grind of flipping cars. What made you think, well, maybe I should take a look at land, or maybe I should look at real estate? Yeah, because I tried it all. I did houses, apartments, all of these things, and it won't work for me in Hawaii. I was like, is there any other way I can try it? And the land is, there's nothing on top of it. So it works great. Absolutely. I love the fact that land is able to be done so remotely. It's a very cool component to the land industry. How did you go about learning when you decided, I think I'm going to do land. How did you learn? Were you in mint? Did you have a mentor? Did you go through courses? Yeah, it's always to have a, a mentor and whenever I hire a mentor, I always go to the highest level. I remember I paid about six, about 60,000 for to this guy to, to tell me how to flip land, but uh, he ended up teaching me how to flip land on terms, which I hate the most. So I changed his system and to when I can just flip it for a profit. Wow. So just want to make sure I heard you correctly. Did you say $60,000 you invested yeah. into teaching? Yeah, 60, yeah. Wow. Wow. So this guy was teaching you how to flip for cash or flip for terms and you wanted to flip for cash. Is that right? Absolutely. I absolutely hate on the sell on terms. <laughs> <laughs> you want fast money or what's the, why don't you like flipping on terms? I guess I'm just doing, not doing it correctly, but I guess also my personality, I, I, I don't have a lot of patience. So I want, I want to invest some money. I can get it out very fast with a huge profit. Right. So yeah. that's how I, which fits for me, because I tried the terms, if you don't have a good system in place, you might end up doing a lot of work without getting paid very well. There's a lot of tire kickers to, for the buyer to buy $150, $200 per month, some type of land like that. Yeah, that's a really great point. I think one of the, the attractive things about uh, flipping on terms and selling on terms is the fact that uh, it opens up the buyer pool, but that's also a double-edged sword. Like you just mentioned, there could be lots of tire pickers, especially at a low purchase price for a monthly payment, like 150 or 200 bucks. Yeah, exactly. So if you have a good system in place, that might be a good business. There's a lot of passive income. And if you have a hundred notes, you know, that might retire you. Yeah, it's definitely, it definitely takes someone that, that wants to lean into that. And like you said, I think it's important for you to know your personality and just lean into that. You have to, not everything will fit every person. You have to work with what works for you. So can you talk to us a little bit about what your very first deal was like? Uh, my very first deal, I bought it for a thousand and I sold it for 2,500. I was like, I joined this term investing groups, right? So I was thinking, how can I make my money back? So the first thing I did was I asked the group, what county do you guys want to buy the land most? Because the term investors, they need a land to sell on terms, right? So they all tell me a county in Colorado. So I started to mail that county and I uh, got a deal for a thousand. I sold it to them, which are the term investor guys and not the end buyers for 2,500 where they can sell on terms for seven or 8,000, $150 per month. 
Wow, really cool. And so you began with the end in mind, you found where the demand was, and then you just went to the county that the demand was there and started marketing for, for land there, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so you always want to go where people want to buy land at, not because as a new investor, you want to think, you always think, okay, I want to go to a place where there's no competition. I can buy the land very fast, no competition. I can sell it very fast. There's no such a place. You go to where the competition is. That's really good. And so on the topic of competition, if someone's listening to this and say, yeah, but there's so much competition. How do you stand out in competitive markets? So what I would say to them is if you want to open a jewelry store, would you open it in the middle of nowhere, like a desert or in the middle of Fifth Avenue in New York, where there's a lot of competition, right? So the reason why people are afraid of competition is they think they're not special deep down. And what make our system so special is we buy the land super cheap because of negotiation skill and uh, the market selection and uh, especially how to make offers. And then we sell the land, we will be the cheapest in the entire market. So we are not afraid of competition. We welcome competition. We love them because with them, that shows how special we are. So we can sell the land very fast, not afraid of competition at all. That is very cool. And so it sounds like a big piece of your business model is negotiation and making sure that the offer is right and that you're buying it at a really good price. What Absolutely. are, what would you consider to be like three of the main keys of successful negotiation? So negotiation start before that. What I mean is you have to know exactly how much you're going to offer for the land. And if you, we typically offer about 40 to 55% on the price, on the value of the land. And then when people call us, they have two options. They either want to sell us the land at the price they got from the letter, or they can just call us to curse on us, right? Which is totally fine. A curse back, release my stress, right? And, and we, if they want to sell, we negotiate again. So we do this double kill, right? And as far as the negotiation, the most three most important thing I was, I would say I teach in my course as well. The first thing is always be leaving, meaning you are not trying to lean in and try to get the deal. You're trying to convince the seller. We're not doing that. What I do is instead of trying to convince the seller, I try to move away. I try to tell the seller, looks like you don't want to sell the land anymore and it uh, looks like this is a good land why don't you just sell it with a realtor so we give them other options seems like we are not interested in, in buying them that's a key component component because if you keep rushing keep pushing the seller will push back but that's the first thing right and uh, the second thing is we do a thing called i i'm not sure so when people ask me any questions I just tell them I'm not sure, right? So I never give them a certain answer. If the seller says, do you want to buy my land? So if you say, yes, I do, that means you're in the seller's mind, you're trying to get my land for a discount. So they're not going to lower the price for you. If they ask me, do you want to buy my land? I tell them, I'm not sure. Do you want to sell? So I ask, I back a question. And the third thing I do when I negotiate is called mirroring. So if the people say something, I will say some similar things back to them. And I do a small summary of what they said and repeat back to them. So people do business with they like and trust. And mirroring is the fastest way to build that trust, ability, to build that trust and likability. That's very cool. So if someone's listening to this, they're new to this whole idea of sales and negotiation, could you give us an example of what mirroring might sound like? So there are three different ways you can mirror, right? So the first one is mirror their speed. So if they talk fast, you want to talk fast. For example, I talk fast, right? So if you, if the seller, if the buyer want to talk to me, they better catch up, right? So if they don't catch up, I would think, oh, this guy might not be as intelligent. 
right? So if you talk very slow and you talk very fast, if, if a seller talk very slow, I talk very fast, uh, the seller might think I'm really annoying. So the first one is mirror their speed. And the second, la secondly, we want to mirror their, their words. So if you ob observe yourself or the people around you, we use certain words all the time. Maybe they say, oh, my land is huge, right? That huge might be a word that guy use often. So I repeat back, okay, not only your land is huge, your tax bill is huge as well. We talk on the words they like to use. And the third thing is we mirror what they said and repeat back to them. Sometimes the seller give you a story. They say, oh, the reason why I bought the land at the first place is my wife wants to move to that place to retire. And now she passed away. I don't want to go there anymore. So that's a story. And you want to do a small summary and repeat it, repeat it back to them. You tell them, oh, your wife passed away. I'm so sorry. She wanted to retire there and now things changed. So that three things you can mirror with the with, with the seller so that they instantly feel like as if you have talked to them before. Wow. Yeah. Those are some fantastic nuggets of wisdom and the negotiation skills. So thanks so much for sharing that. I do want to talk about this $900,000 net profit year that you had. So what a journey it must've been going from doing a deal that was a thousand dollars and then ending up where you had a year where you made nine hundred thousand dollars so how did you bridge the gap between there it seems like that's a really far far distance between those two yeah so when i started to do the smaller deals i was doing car flipping as well so the small deals come and the first year i made about three hundred thousand dollars profit and uh, i was like is that it because i flip cars i make more than that and I was like, is there any way I can make it better? I guess I just have to, I know my, myself, whenever I have to have a moment of improvement, I have to push myself. So I move entirely from Hawaii where I make about fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 per month flipping cars. I moved to Florida. So when you do that shift, that income got cut off. So I had to do something, right? So I got panicked. And then I started to ask around, got hold of a military who made about war million in about 10 months. And uh, then I was like, is there a better way to do that? And uh, he taught me to, to do that. Uh, we had some phone calls and then everything changed. I do from only the small, smaller deals to bigger deals from then. Wow. And so... When you say bigger deals, are you referring to the size as well or just higher value properties? Higher value. Now this. Yeah. So sometimes the size is still even smaller. Wow. So what deals would you, what types of deals would you say that you specialize in now? I do infill loss. A lot of time there's different ways to invest in land. There's a way that you can invest in. Infill loss, meaning you drive around, you see a lot of houses in the middle of it. There's a land that's called infill loss, right? And uh, there's a raw land, which I'm not the guy to talk to. Infill, raw land means you drive around, you see nothing but land. And there's commercial lots. There is people buying land and sell it by subdividing them and sell it for parts. I don't do that as well. So I only do buy and sell infill lots. And as far as the bigger deals, what I mean is the value of the land. Got it. So what would an average deal look like? It's an infill lot, but what around what size would you say? And what is the profit margin on your average deals? I try to get at least 10,000 profit or I prefer $20,000 on each, pro each deal as far as profit, yeah. Excellent, excellent. If that's about your average deal uh, size, I'm thinking that you're flipping anywhere between 50 to 90 uh, infill lots in a single year to get to that $900,000 number. So that must take quite some uh, impressive systems. Right? Uh, I don't have a much, a very good system, honestly. I have a one virtual assistant two dollar an hour 
And uh, because in the system, in my program, I teach people there are six steps. The first step is how to make, how to choose a market, which will take you about 30 minutes. And then the second uh, step is make offers. So that will take you about one to two hours, depends on how uh, much, how, how much you do it and uh, how familiarized with you have with the system. And the third step is how to value the land. We look at 20 different things about the land so that you never lose money. And the fourth thing is negotiation. That two combined will cost you about five to 10 minutes per deal you talk to, right? And after that, we teach about how to find the rivers and title company, and then we sell it with them. So there's much things that I can sell it. If you look back on the six steps, there's not two the things that you have to do to make it work. Right, and all of these things can be done virtually. Absolutely. I was in China for a month. I just came back yesterday. I did four or five deals. Wow. They just sign. Wow. I'll sign, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love it. And I as love far it. as older, you can do online. Yeah. Yeah, that's incredible. That's incredible. So looking at your six steps, can you talk about how you go about picking a market? So I don't go to the first tier market, meaning like Dallas, Austin. I don't go to those because they're too competitive. And uh, I don't really go to cities that are too far away from them either. So I go to about two, 30 minutes to two hours away from those major growing cities. Let's say that someone's listening to this and they're brand new uh, to real estate investing to land and they hear, okay, I can go 30 minutes outside of a large city uh, mm. to find a market. Is there any other factor that you look at when you're determining a market? Absolutely. So we want a market or a county that has more than about 40 to 50 sold in the last three months for that Very county. Good. Yeah. Very good. Excellent. Yeah. And so let's shift gears now to the actual deal criteria. So is there a size range or a value range that you look for whenever you are pulling your data? Absolutely. As far as the size, on the East Coast, typically it's under three acres because over three acres uh, get pricey, very pricey. And on the West Coast, there is no, not too much of uh, a size limit because the size in the West Coast doesn't matter. You can buy a uh, hundred acres in Arizona for under 10,000, right? Sometime. And mm -hmm. as far as the value, I try to stay between 10,000 to 300,000 in this range. Yeah, cool. because if the land got too cheap, I might have to spend a lot of time to do that. The deal cannot afford a realtor to sell it, so it's not worth the time. And if they get too expensive, more than 300000 sometimes it just take a whole lot longer to sell it. That makes total sense. And what is your favorite marketing method? What are you using to uh, reach out to sellers? I do a, a letter with a offer price. People could choose, right? And they either get a, the offer accepted or they get offended, right? So I like that. <laughs> Got it. And so are you literally just pulling the county value for the property and then offering a percentage of that? Or how do you go about formulating your offers on these blind offer letters? Yeah, so we first have to download a, a list called a comparable list where we know exactly how much uh, price per sold per acre in that particular subdivision. And then, uh, by the way, if you want to look at how I do it specifically, me and Joe McCall had an interview. We uh, explained specifically how to do it. I showed him how to do it. And then after you download the comparable list, we use that comparable list to download the mailing list. And if we got all the subdivisions, match all the subdivisions, and then we make offers 40 to 55% on the sold price in that particular subdivision. Awesome. I love that. And so what is your stats in terms of marketing? How many mailers are you sending out a month? Last month, I didn't send out too much. I was in China, but uh, this month, I'm going to send as usual, which is about twenty to 30,000 mailers per month. Wow. And 
out of those, what is your deal to letter ratio? How many letters typically does it take to get one deal? I actually don't track it, but I try to normally it's got 1% respond rate for every deal that people call me. I try to get a deal. So I, I don't, don't, don't really track KPI. That's my, I can, I think that's my weakness. <laughs> got it. Got it. You can hire that out. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask you this. If you were offering 40 to 50% of the value of the property in a competitive market, um, how do you contend against people that typically in these larger competitive markets, you have brand new people that may not know exactly how to value the property. So they're offering way more mm -hmm. than what your model would allow for. So how do you, you mention negotiation, but how do you cut through the noise and get some of those deals? I guess you just have to mail often and follow up, right? And people get letters all the time. And for the people who don't want to sell, they don't even look at your letter. Just, just, just throw it away, right? And then all of a sudden you get my letter. And then if I, if they see it often, or if I follow up more, the money is in the follow up, right? You build this trust and like ability and people will like it more and start to do business with you. Yeah, that's great. What does your follow up sequence look like? For the people who are motivated, I see there's some motivation maybe every week, right? So for the people who are not sure if they want to sell yet, maybe every month. Got not it. Too often. Yeah. And are you calling for the follow-up? What does that look like? Yeah, I just call them. And the, the key thing I teach my student is do not follow up to just talk about the land. Some people say, just say, did you make a decision? Are you, do you, I, do you know now if you want to sell yet? That's the wrong way to follow up because people don't want to hear about that all the time. And uh, instead of that, I just talk about their life, right? So I talk about their dog, right? Talk about their cat. I talk about their family, sons, daughters, and just talk about their land. And the key thing is, do you think they really don't know if they, why you call them? They, they, they know why you call them, right? You're not talking to them just randomly. So eventually he will circle back about the land. He will tell you, oh, about the land, I'm not sure yet. The, about the land, I'll be ready next month. Don't talk about the land is the key when you follow up. Because if you only talk about the land, eventually they see your number and they, they'll be like, oh, that's the Ray guy. I want to talk about the land. I'm not going to pick it up. That's really good. Yeah, building those relationships, so important to the, yeah. just the whole no like and trust process. Whenever you are looking for realtors, you mentioned that you use realtors in the dispo process. Is that right? So how do you go about finding the realtors and figuring out if these are people that you actually want to work with? So I, first of all, I talk to a lot of realtors and specifically, I don't randomly just search them. I don't search Orlando land realtors. I only contact people who sold land nearby. The best way to know your area is to find a realtor who sold land nearby not uh, search randomly. And then I could talk to some of them and uh, you will feel which one is the best for you, right? Got yeah. it. Yeah, that's really good. Making sure that person is an expert in the area that you're working, super important. And so Absolutely. what are some of your main deal breakers when you're looking at properties? What types of things would just kill the deal off the bat for you? I would say maybe sometime they're deal breaker. I'm, I don't have a lot of deal breakers, but I was, I would say maybe they have to talk to someone else and maybe they're not the decision maker. Maybe they have to talk to their wife. So it's important that we get all the on board, decision maker on board when you first talk to them. Yeah, that's really yeah. good. Yeah. Really good. And so what would you consider to be the most important needle moving activities to take daily if you're brand new to this business? It's a consistent action towards one singular goal. A lot of time we try to do a lot of things at the same time and myself included at the beginning, I try to do land, I try to do the houses at the same time. I, what my thinking process is, let me try them both and see what works. And I will stick to that one. And guess what? 
if you're trying to chase two rabbits, none of them will work. So whatever you do on the two things, it's not going to work for you. You're just wasting your time and money. So choose one and stick to that and uh, choose as specifically as you can. So if, if you do land flipping, it's not specifically enough. It's not specific enough. So you have to choose if you want to do infill loss or roll land, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want to do roll land, stick to that and take consistent actions. For example, mail more, right? Talk to more people, negotiate more, and you make offers more. And on the infill loss alone, you will make a lot of money. Hey there, land fans. If you're enjoying this episode and would like to see more episodes like this, please be sure to let us know by liking and subscribing below. Now, that's really good advice, really niching down and becoming a specialist in that area. Really Absolutely. good. Advice. So are you closing on all of the deals that you find or are you assigning them or how do you go about structuring the deal? Yeah, I close on them because cash has power. A lot of time people say, yeah, let me do the wholesaling. Wholesaling could be a good way to do when you don't have money, but I don't suggest you do it for a long time. Because if you do wholesaling, your end buyers, cash buyers who are very smart, they're not going to pay you anything close to market price. And also it's uh, significantly limit your ability to go to multiple markets at the same time. Think about to get all the cash buyers from each county. That'd be a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. that's really good. That's a good insight. And so what are some of your favorite tools or resources that you use in your business right now? I use ListSource, and uh, which helps me a lot on making offers. And by the way, if you guys need a uh, 80% off, 80, not 18, 80% off, let me know. I have the contact to, to make it happen. I use ListSource. I use Google Excel sheet, a yellow pad. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So you're not using AI in your business yet, I take it. No, not yet. <laughs> nice. <laughs> What does your team look like? I have a one VA and that's it. Wow. Wow. So you yeah. and a VA, $900,000 net profit. My yeah. goodness, that's impressive. In one year, that's remarkable. What is your favorite thing about the land business? Uh, you can do it virtually anywhere, no matter what country you're in. And also land... People don't have emotions, not too much emotions attached to land. Uh, for houses, people has all these good memories, so they're not going to give you a very good deal. So for land, sometimes they give them a very painful experience, so they want to get rid of it. I got a couple of land for free last year. I sold each of them for 20 grand, 15,000. 15, it just happens. Sometimes I have a student who I told him, you can get free land. He doesn't believe me. And a couple of weeks ago, he sent me a text. He said, Ray, I never believe you when you say I can get a free land. And he just got land worth about, I think, 45 grand. Wow. Yeah. So for the doubters in, that are listening to this, what are the circumstances that, that led you to free land? I think maybe they hate it so much, right? And they have to pay all the fees. They have to pay the, all the tickets. Sometimes they get old, they don't want to deal with it. That's probably why. So they just say, take this headache. I don't want to deal with it anymore. As long as you take it, I'll just give it to you. Absolutely. <laughs> it happens. Uh, yeah. Love it. I love that. So we have a lot of international listeners, people mm -hmm. that maybe citizens of a different country that want to flip land in the U.S. What type of advice would you have for those people as they are starting their businesses and growing their businesses? International, first of all, I, was, I would assume you might need a, a company or uh, at least a bank account to make land flipping works. And uh, if you don't have a bank account, that might be hard in the U.S. And uh, secondly, some type of U.S. identity so that when you do the notary, you can make it work. So either online notary or you come to the States to do the notary in person, they require uh, ID. So if you have the ID, that'd be fine. If you have to add two things, you can make it work. Excellent. And so 
if someone is listening to this and say, okay, I want to do land. I love, I'm totally sold on the virtual nature of this business. The fact that you can do it remotely. I love it. I want to flip land from my, from my living room in my underwear. What are some of the ninja hacks to being really successful in flipping land remotely? Remotely. So not too much of a hack, but you have to have your phone keep ringing. So you have to mail a lot of offers. The more offer you're going to mail, the more deals you're going to have. So that's the thing. That's the secret. And keep following up and have a whole bunch of yellow pads. You can call anytime, just call them back and talk about their life. So to see if they're ready to sell you the land. And if you are on the phone all the time, or you hire a guy or an acquisition manager to be on the phone all the time, you're bound to make a lot of money. Yeah, now that's great. It's really not a super advanced or complex business model, right? Absolutely so not. Yeah. What would you consider to be the biggest challenge in the land business? I don't see a lot of challenge. I have people who don't know nothing about land in the program before they join and now they make a lot of money. I think it's not the land that has challenge, it's their personality has some challenge. So if you try a thing that you want to do and then all of a sudden you hit some obstacles and you tend to give up right away, that's the challenge, right? So a lot of time we see all this Facebook ad or Instagram ad, random person jump in the screen and tell you how easy their business is without doing a lot of work. So we fall into those trap. We think, oh, there might be another business that takes less time, can make more money. So I better try that. So that's a trap, right? That's a no business. I can promise is that easy. So every business or every niche has something you don't see on the surface, which you have to go through that whole process very painfully. So if you're not having the ability to go through that process painfully yourself and stick to it, that's a huge challenge. And uh, whatever you do will be a failure. And if you do a thing that you never give up, I'm just going to do this until I, I would die trying, right? So that thing will work out for you. And guess what? Every niche has some people make a lot of money. You just have to be that person first. Yeah, I love that mindset because it, it's so true. It's so true what you just said. In terms of expectations, if you go into the land industry with expectations that this is going to be the easiest thing and people will just be breaking your doors down to, to give you their properties and you're going to be a millionaire in 30 days, then you're setting <laughs> yeah. yourself up for some heartache, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And you have to persevere through that for sure. And I think whenever you, the most successful people that I've come in touch with in the land space and really with anything is that they embrace the pain whenever it is hard and they just figure it out and move forward regardless. Absolutely. So what's something that in your opinion, not enough people are talking about in the land industry that we should be talking about right now? I would say, I think that's my specialty, which is negotiation. So I would say negotiation is very important because a lot of time we think bargaining is negotiation. Bargaining is you go to the flea market, someone wants something for $10, you say, how about $5, right? And not too much people talk about negotiation. So first thing you have to negotiate is before you negotiate, you have to find out what's wrong with the land. And then you can use that to negotiate against a seller. And hopefully you can get a, a deal that have the win situation. I think that's the thing that we can keep emphasizing because the reason why I can get a lot of deals for such a cheap price is because of negotiation. For example, I had a deal a couple of months ago. I sent out the offers. The offer price was 13000 And after about 20 minutes of talking of negotiation, I bought that land for 1000 so that's how much negotiation 
you can, how much room you can negotiate. Wow, that is incredible. You said something just now that, that really resonated with me, that negotiation is not the same thing as bargaining. Can you dive into that a little bit deeper? Yes, it's a lot more than just bargaining about the price. For example, if I want to buy a car and your car is you listed for 15000 or 10000 I can go there and say, hey, how about five grand? And normally you just push back and say no, right? So what if I do this instead? I'll walk around, shake my head and be very serious. And now you start to think, is there anything wrong? That's the first thing to break you, right? So second thing to break you is I don't tell you what's wrong with your land because you get defensive, right? I just look at the car around. I will just point out what's wrong with it. I say if I'm talking to myself, right? So I'll point out, oh, that, you know, this windshield is cracked. The tire's bold. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to myself. So when I actually talk to you, I'll be like, yeah, I'm so sorry. It looks like I know you want 10,000, but I just cannot do that because I have to spend a few thousand on this and that. Yeah, I'm not sure. What's the best you can do? So now you're not talking about the price, right? At, at the beginning. So you have to first find out what's wrong with the thing you're buying. It's the same thing with the land. So the reason why I'm my negotiation is my strongest strength is I have been buying and selling cars on the street for more than eight years. So a lot of time, all the car dealers, they just take this simpler route, which is they go to the auction and raise the number tag and they just bid on the price. I, I don't like to do that. So I just go straight to the seller and negotiate. So I can be able to see a lot of reactions from the seller. I know how to say uh, the right thing after you do it so many times. The same thing with the land. If you find uh, what's wrong with the land, you negotiate. Wow. So can you talk to us a little bit about the that the deal that you mentioned earlier, the thirteen that thirteen thousand dollars, and you got it down to one thousand dollars? How did that happen? Yeah, that's a. Uh... Good example. I sent an offer for thirteen thousand. The land was about twenty six thousand, about twenty seven thousand. So he accepted that, and then he sent me the offer letter back, and then I just negotiate on the phone with him. So the the first call goes like this: I look at the land. It has high tension wires on top of the land. If the land has high tension wires, you cannot build a house underneath, right? So that's a big thing. And second thing is it has a dirt road. It's not a concrete road, not paved at all. And also it's right next to the highway, very noisy. So that three things. And also there's a lot of trees, right? I have to cut it and I have to spend money to, to cut it. So I talked to him. I said, yeah, I'm so sorry. Uh, looks like there's a lot of trees on the land. I might have to spend a few thousand to clean it up. And... Uh, also, there's high tension wires on top of the land. You cannot build underneath. So that kind of squeeze the size of the house we want to build. Yeah, I don't know. Typically, we normally um, pay a few thousand for a land like that. So I gave them a range. So what is a few thousand? A few thousand is not 11,000. It's under 10,000. You can call it a few thousand, right? So what I'm really asking is, can you lower the price to under 10,000? So now you want to see his reaction. So if he reacts very quickly with a no, that means you touch his bottom already, right? People don't know what they want, but they absolutely know what they don't want. I tell him, I, I can only do a few thousand for land like that. If you say, I'm a few thousand, are you kidding me? So that means he already at the bottom. But he said, yeah, a few thousand, I guess I can do that. So that's the first step you need to take. And I see his reaction is not too certain. So I want to go down even more, right? So I said, not only that, Yulan has a lot of, it's not even paved, right? So it's on the dirt road and it's on the highway, which make, his, make it very noisy. Yeah, I don't know how much I can do, but typically we pay about two or three grand for land like that. 
right? And he said, yeah, I can probably do 3,000. And after he considered it for so long. And then he agreed to that. So when you negotiate, you always, you always want to go to a point that people get mad. So he's not mad yet. So it's, that's not his bottom. So I said, uh, yeah, let me call you back. Uh, is that okay? I'll call you back in a few hours. So let me go there uh, to, to check it out. So I went there virtually. <laughs> I didn't really go there. I went, went on Google Map, Refn. I tried to make sure there's no way I can lose money at 3000 right? And I saw that everything sold for 30000 28 There's no way I can lose my money. So I called him back. I said, yeah, I'm so sorry. He said, what? I said, yeah, it looks like the condition is a little bit more severe than I thought. I can only do a thousand for this land. And after a long silence, he said, yes. So that's how you do it. So you don't want to jump off the cliff and you say, how about a thousand, right? So if you do that, people cannot take it. So I tell people in the negotiation course, you have to take the stairs one by one and see his reaction. Now you know what at what point he got mad. And that's probably the price you want to focus on. That's really good. So many great tips in that. And I love how you talk about that one step at a time. It literally guides them through an evolution versus just trying to throw out a low number, which would probably result in a no. Yeah, absolutely. So, when you negotiate and you touch, you finally get down to the number that touches the nerve and they start freaking out and they say, no, how do you reel it back in? So it doesn't just blow it up. Yeah. So what if people get really mad? There's a way you can drag them back. And what I say is, Hey, hey, hey I'm just kidding. Right. Don't get mad. <laughs> I, th I thought it was funny, but maybe not funny to you. Right. And then I said, uh, that. I'm living in my ideal world right now. In the ideal world, if I can get at that price, that may be that might be a hallelujah for me. But of course, we are living in the reality. I understand you cannot do that. But let me ask you this. How close can you get to that number? So you yeah. are still dragging them to you. And yeah. then they'll tell you, oh, yeah. And, and when you negotiate, the key thing is not to give a specific number. So you, if you look back on the 1,000 deal, I didn't give a specific number until the last one. So I always give a range. Even when you give a range, you have a room you can, you can negotiate, right? If you give a specific number at the beginning, you basically give them an option to choose a yes or no. And most of the time it's a no. Once they see you as a low baller, they were not going to pick up your phone anymore. They're mm -hmm. not going to reply your text anymore, right? So right. you have to give them a range so that you can still uh, be in the game. That's really good. That is really good stuff. My gosh, yeah, I can't wait to listen to that again because I know that you've got so many, just the language that you use frames it in such a way that it keeps the line of communication open for negotiation mm -hmm. versus just shutting it down. I think that's yeah. so, that's incredible. So are there any negotiation masters that you look up to? There are three books I recommend people to read. Of course, the master is Ray, but I'm just kidding. You can always- Besides uh, you, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so besides me, there's another guy. It's a little bit better. His name is Chris, uh, Chris Voss. Never Split the Difference is his book. And uh, he was a hostage negotiator. So that's more severe, right? So you can see how he negotiated with, with the criminals. And the second book is called Flip the Script. It's a yellow book. Don't buy the yellow, don't buy the pretty girl one. There's another pretty girl one wrote same name, but it's not that one, right? The last one is called Go for No, right? That's a great book. So Go for No is a concept that you, instead of trying to say to people for a affirmative answer, you go for no. For example, if you cannot get hold of someone, normally we say, hey, are you still looking to sell your land? So it's, Normally we ask that, right? 
And typically they don't answer you. They don't text you back. So what I learned from that book is you, instead of asking that, you say, look like you don't want to sell the land anymore. So now they look at that natural respond is to uh, reply with a no. No, I still want to sell. When do you want yeah. to sell then? So you can keep the conversation going. Yeah, that's fantastic. Those are fantastic books for sure. Are there any other just business owners, entrepreneurs that you that you like to follow in general? Sometimes maybe maybe I'm wrong. So don't listen to me if you think I'm wrong. Instead of learning more, I want you to do more. For example, I I talked to my own mentor the other day. I said the wealth of information leads to the poverty of attention. The more information you learn, actually the bad for you, the worse for you. If you learn all these different niches, you might feel satisfied, accomplished. Oh, I learned something today. What did you get, right? As far as the revenues, right? So you might want to learn less and do more on a singular niche. And then you attention will be more and uh, you're going to take more actions. So you can make more money. At the end of the day, you have more money than anyone else. So that's what matters the most in my point of view. Yeah, no, that is really good. I love that mindset. Obviously, education is very important. You have to know what you're doing. But at the end of the day, learning is not doing right. Mm -hmm. You can read you know, a thousand books, but that won't put a single dollar in your bank account unless you act on it. So that's absolutely stuff. Really good. So what is the biggest surprise you've had so far in your land career? I was surprised how people will sell the land for such a cheap price. When I started to do bigger deals, my first deal, I bought it for 6,000. The original offer was 25,000 and uh, I sold it for 58,000. Wow. Yeah, and that's how deep of a discount people will give to you. Uh, of course, you just have to mail and uh, make it work. Land is, in my point of view, is the easiest uh, real estate investing there is. Yeah, no, that's incredible. So let me ask you this question. When you, you mentioned earlier, the money is in the follow-up. At what point would you consider a lead dead? Yeah, they tell me don't call me anymore. So that that's You're probably keep going until you get until you get the F word. Right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> got it. Okay, and if you could go back and tell yourself three pieces of advice when you were first starting off in the land space, what would they be? Uh, I think the first one is don't try to learn a lot of different stuff and just do pick one thing and start doing that and don't give up until you make it work. So that's probably the first one. And the second one is don't expect it will be easy because no business is ever easy and just stick to it. And when you hit a, a obstacle, you just have to uh, go along with it. So it make you stronger. And in the process, once you make yourself work and uh, the business is going to work as well. And thirdly, I would do, I would always pick a mentor of whatever you want to choose to do. So if you want to pick the easiest route, pick a mentor, that might be the easiest thing to do. Because the mentor already know what not to do, what to do. You just follow them. And of course, you need to find a mentor that not a professional, a professor type. You want a guy who actually have results to be your mentor. Yeah. So that's probably the three things I would do over again. Yeah. Those are incredible pieces of advice. Those belong in a poster on your office wall somewhere. If you are first starting out, I know... They're constant reminders for me as well. So thank you for sharing that. What's your biggest passion or goal you'd like to achieve at this point in your life? I get, well, I went back to China and uh, that really gave me some different point of view. Sometimes we think how hard our life is because you haven't looked at those people yet. 
I look at all the, my old friend and all the surrounding people have to go to a huge bus to go to work. I can eat a breakfast with whole different things for a dollar in China. So I could really retire there right now. So it's not about the money anymore. And for example, last month, flipping land, I made about 60,000. I could literally live that for the whole two years in China, not budgeting at all. I just want to, I can buy whatever I want there, but it's not about the money anymore. So right now I just try to maybe keep my land business going and uh, I have about a hundred students right now. So I want to make them success, successful, right? Yeah, that's fantastic perspective. That's really good. That's really good stuff. What makes you feel inspired or like your best self? What do you mean? Sorry. <laughs> what lights you up? Oh, uh, I love learning. I love to, I'm just curious, right? So you want to, I want to learn all different things, different perspective. But I just, I know I just said, don't learn too much, but I mean, don't learn too much about other niches rather than what you do. But you do want to know a lot of, about economy, about the mindset, about how to invest your money, because that's another different game. When you make the money, some people lose it. So it's like, as if they've done nothing, you make the money. Now you have to learn how to invest it. So you want to learn all those different things. That's my passion. Yeah, that's very cool. And, and what are some of your favorite investment vehicles right now? I just shared a Instagram post yesterday, which mean, which I said a lot of people give financial advices or investment advices. They, they tell you, oh, land is the best investment. Or some people say stocks. Some people say cryptos. Invest this crypto, you earn a lot of money. It's better than anything else. It's not the vehicles that are the fastest will take you longer. It is what you know better will take you the longest. So if a particular thing the most, that's your game. And you just want to invest there. So that's my advice. And just invest the things that you absolutely don't invest the things you don't know. And do not rely on anyone or any institution with your whole net worth, never bet against that. For example, there are people get scammed on the FTX. On the There's another old guy who scammed a lot of people. His name is Bernie Madoff. There was a documentary I just watched. It was very funny. But a lot of people lost a lot of money with him, right? Bernie Madoff. So who is he? He was the president of NASDAQ, right? How reliable... It can be, right? So if a president of NASDAQ call me and tell me, give me a million, I'll probably give him, right? But not right now. If he call me right now, I wouldn't give him to him because I wouldn't trust anyone, not even presidents, to give me all my net worth to invest with him. Yeah, that's really good. That's good stuff. So you mentioned you have over 100 students right now. What are some of the biggest mistakes that you see typically when the students make? Maybe they, their action and uh, their commitment is not aligned. So they say, I'm committed to the game, but they don't mail. You're not committed then, right? So the more you mail, the more committed you are and the more deals you're gonna get, right? Yeah, so if you have a commitment, let that commitment be aligned with your actions. Love it. I love it. Yeah. That's spot on, spot on. I just want to thank you so much, Ray, for joining us and for giving us so much value today. How can we give back to you right now? What are you currently looking for in terms of resources or connections that we can help you with? If you have any questions, just uh, Instagram. Uh, I have an Instagram or just text me. Uh, my Instagram is uh, virtual flip land, virtual flip land, one word. And my phone number is 808-308-3227. So any questions, I'm happy to help and just call me or just uh, send me a text through Instagram. Awesome. Thank you so much again. This has been absolutely incredible. Your journey is just remarkable. 
to hear you know how you came to the states and were homeless and now you're having nine hundred thousand dollar years sixty thousand dollar months ray thank you so much you've been absolutely incredible this i've learned so much and was so inspired by your story and all of the things and i can't wait to dig a little deeper into negotiation myself thank you guys so much ray you are awesome you have a great week we'll catch you guys in the next one everyone take care be safe see you around if you're interested in hearing from other six and seven figure land flippers about how they've built and run their businesses then check out my group only land fans where i do a live interview each week inside the group you can grab that link at the description below until then, be great, have a great week, and catch you in the next one.